at the School of Architecture, Tianjin University of China. She presents her research plan on early warning measures of cultural heritage under climate change, taking the summer palace in Beijing as an example. After her, uh, Dr. Panayota Manti uh, will have uh, her paper. She's assistant professor at Department of Environment of Union University in Greece. Dr. Monti presents a paper on contribution to understanding the impact of climate change on Europe's tangible cultural heritage and discusses an analysis of IPCC data on humidity, precipitation, and temperature in Europe. And finally, Dr. Iman Abdul Rahman uh, will have her paper. She works in the urban climate change sector and has experience in the field of local climate zones, urban climate models, environmental studies, climate change mitigation and adaptation. She's correct, currently part of the Egyptian Heritage Rescue Foundation, EHRF, and is an environmental studies researcher and expert in GIS. Today, she presents local climate change zones of Rosetta City in Egypt. She talks about a study to create a local climate zone with open source data. After these six presentations, we will have a short question and answer and conclusion session with all the panelists. Please use the chat box to put your questions and comments for the panelists and we will take them from there. If you are not a speaker, please keep your microphone and camera off during the presentations. Thank you. I think we can now start with our first presentation. I kindly ask Rapal to moderate this part and keep the time for speakers and invite the first speaker. Thank you very much. Rapal, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Rouhani. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Um, yes, we are all set for the presentation. So as Dr. Rouhani mentioned, I will be keeping the time. Our presenters will have a total of 10 minutes to present their work. At the end of eight minutes, I will be ringing a short alarm so that to tell you that you are just two minutes away from ending a presentation. So with that, uh, I would take the honor of inviting Dr. Henry Wellington to present his work titled pertaining to the Southern Coastal Regions of Ghana. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you be as you listen to me. And I bring you greetings from my home, the comfort of my home here in Accra, Ghana. Mr. Moderator, before I read my paper, I want to make some uh, opening remarks. First is that there should be a slight correction in the title of my paper. Uh, it's supposed to read climate and heritage pertaining to the southeastern coastal regions of Ghana. There's a need to emphasize this because the southeastern coastal regions of Ghana geographically are described as a coastal savanna region and it has quite significant uh, relevance to the paper I'm going to read. The second remark I want to make is that this paper which I'm going to read has been prepared in consultation with an expert who has specialized in scientific study of the changes taking place in the southern coastal regions uh, here in Ghana uh, as a result of climate change. I've also been working together with his wife. This expert is called Professor Kwesi Aptiani Ado, and his wife, who is an architect, is called Dr. Aaron Aptiani Ado. I've been working with the two of them to uh, prepare this paper. Now, Mr. Borita, let me make the next uh, remark. The fact that um, uh, in consultation with experts, I'd like to emphasize the point that this paper is not based on 
a specific scientific study, but it's based more on my personal observations and my indigenous knowledge, which I acquired uh, here in Ghana, whilst growing up in the community in the southern coastal, southeastern coastal part of the, this country. Now, having said this, I would like to proceed with making some points. As I've said, basically not out of scientific study, but more from general observations and from common knowledge. Now, I must say that the points I'm ad advancing in this paper have come from my own observation of what has been happening to this part of the country as a result of the climate change and the effects we are having here in this part of the world. Now, the information I have has emanated from the cultural groups with which I've been working in the Ga Adangwe region of the southeastern coastal part of the country. So to a large extent, my information is informed by the cultural nuances which are associated with the people of this part of the country I've been working in. So now, after having uh, made these opening remarks, Mr. Moderator, let me now go on to address the essence of the paper, which I want to share with the audience. Now, as a result of the climate change taking place in this country, in this part of the world, there have been manifestations of some threats to Ghanaian heritage resources, which I want to uh, bring to the attention of this audience. I've enumerated five threats to the Ghanaian uh, heritage resources and I will briefly speak to these uh, points as I bring them out. The first point as a manifested threat to the Ghanaian heritage resources because of climate change has to do with the observed continuous rising of sea water levels along the beaches here in the southeastern coastal part of the country. And as I said earlier on, this has not come, this observation has not come from any research which I have done, but I have been for, informed by the research work which Professor Kwesi Apenya Ado uh, has been engaged in during the past few years. So the observation of the continuous rising of seawater levels along the beaches is a scientific definite observation based on the work of Professor Rishi Apioni Ado. And this phenomenon has led to threat on the settlements, the coastal settlements uh, where this rising of the seawater levels have been observed. And it's important to know that some of these coastal settlements have very important cultural heritage properties, including world heritage sites in Ghana. So it is very important for us to take note of the fact that the continuous rising of the sea water levels along the beaches have very serious uh, implications, not only for Ghana, but for the whole world, because the properties which I'm referring to are of world heritage status. Now, the second threat which I want to share uh, with the audience 
has to do with the serious erosion and inundation of shorelines taking place in the southern, southeastern coastal part of the country as a result of the observable effects of the climate change. Now, this erosion and inundation of the shorelines are pushing traditional flora and fauna into near extinction. A case in point is a shrinking of the extent of some of the coastal sacred mangroves and the vanishing of the cultural practices associated with these mangroves. In addition to that, it's observed that the indigenous sisal hemp, which botanically is called uh, agave sisalana on the beaches of Accra and Osu are going into extinct to a large extent in some parts of the coastal areas, they cannot be seen any longer as a result of what has been happening with the uh, erosion and inundation of the shorelines. In addition to this, it is observed that as a result of what is happening, this phenomenon of the inundation of the shorelines, the West African marine turtle, biologically known as Careta Careta, uh, being endangered. They are no longer coming to the beaches in many uh, parts of the uh, region uh, to uh, hatch or to lay their eggs and have them hatched. So they're gradually getting into extinction here in this part of the, of the world. In addition to that, we have the so-called ghost sun crabs biologically known as Osipoda africana, also going to extinct because their habitat are being inundated with the rising sea water level uh, in this part of Ghana. Now, the third threat which have been observed is the occurrence of flash flooding in settlements, which cause polluting and muddying of many a times size of memory. During the flash flooding periods, we tend to have mud and debris of plastic wastes being pushed into these uh, groves, making them to become uh, completely uh, demarred and defaced, which will not relate very well to the cultural practices which are associated with these uh, water bodies. Thirdly, there is an observed occurrence of shortening of the period of the dry season in the coastal areas. At the moment in Ghana, we have the Hamatan, which is the dry season, but it started fairly late. In the past, the dry season will start at the beginning of December. But now, just recently, we have had rains occurring in the period of uh, December, which had prolonged or had shortened the period of the Hamatan. The Hamatan has just started this January. Is going to go on till about February, and that's about it. That has resulted in the high level of humidity occurring in this part of the country. And these high humidity levels are attributable, attributable to emerging negative conditions found in building structures. For example, rapid fouling in building fabric and components and making cultural heritage sites and fabrics of built heritage, built heritage structures to experience decay and disintegrate uncontrollably and thereby consequently destroy both cultural and intangible cultural heritages. The final observed point is the fact that there is an observed 
accelerated selling capillary action in building substructures and external walls. As a result of the rising of the sea water levels in this part of the country. Now, this phenomenon that we observe is affecting a number of very important stone masonry heritage buildings. A case in point is what has been uh, observed in Accra at Osu, the over 100 years old stone masonry uh, church building has been experiencing very rapid accelerated selling capillary action in the substructure, which has caused the church authorities to act unprofessionally, so to speak, because they're acting as a kind of a panic uh, response to the observation of the accelerated selling capillary action in the buildings. And they have completely faced- Professor Wellington, sorry to interrupt yes. you. If you could kindly uh, wrap up quickly, we are running short of time. Okay, All right. sorry. so yes, Mr. Morita, I've come almost to the end and I want to uh, end uh, with some conclusions which I've made uh, respect to recommendations which have to be considered by Ghana, by the countries in West Africa, and for, the, for that matter, the countries in the world. Now, these recommendations briefly are said there must be a definite and scientifically crafted policy at national, regional, district, and local community tribunal levels to deal with and mitigate human actions that foster and promote the process of climate change. Two, communities located in geographical zones where effects of climate change are manifesting endemically should be assisted to build capacities to live proactively with the effects of climate change with a goal to change negative habits and practices that exacerbate effects of climate change and install and enforce local planning regulations and bylaws for their settlements to withstand the negative effects of climate change. Thirdly, institutes of architects and institutions of engineers are to revise design standards to make building structures, especially heritage buildings, more versatile and strengthen against effects of climate change. The final recommendation is that there's a need for attitudinal change in the so-called Ghanaian culture of lack of maintenance and to adapt attitude of conscious care and preservation of the built environment and built heritage as a result of the negative effects of climate change. Now I rest my case and thank you very much for paying attention to what I've said. Thank you, Professor Wellington. Thank you so much for that insightful narration and and you made it very clear that it's based on your observation and your indigenous knowledge which is apparently very very important when we are trying to understand risk thank you so much for being a part of the discussion uh, without any uh, delays let me move on to our next presenter dr rohani the floor is yours thank you very much rapal let me share my screen okay thank you uh Hello again, uh, Bijan here. Um, I, I introduced myself, so I, I quickly start my presentation. I briefly, I mean, today discussed the impacts of climate change and cultural heritage in Sistan region in southwestern Afghanistan and eastern Iran using the Yamina methodology. The Yamina or the Endangered Archaeology in the Middle East and North Africa project is funded by the Arcadia Fund, a charitable fund of Lisbeth Rosing and Peter Baldwin, and also the British Council's Cultural Protection Fund. The project is a partnership between the universities of Oxford, Leicester, and Durham in the UK. Yamina uses satellite imagery to rapidly record and make available information about heritage sites and landscapes which are under threat, and the project covers over 20 countries in this region. In recent decades, climate and environmental changes have severely affected Afghanistan and Iran. 
In Afghanistan, over 80% of the population still relies directly on the natural resources to meet their daily needs. Decades of conflict and instability, displacement of people, and a lack of management and institutional capacity have heavily damaged Afghanistan's natural resources and environments. Climate change and prolonged droughts have worsened the environmental crisis in the country. In Iran, Iran with over 745 million tons annual emission of carbon dioxide, the country is the first greenhouse emitter in the Middle East and the sixth in the world. In water sector, Iran is facing one of the most critical situations in the Middle East uh, region. It is, it is feared that the country will be, will be facing water bankruptcy. Unsustainable development approach and supply-based policies combined with climate change have intensified the environmental crisis in Iran as well. The vast and historical region of Sistan is located between Iran and Afghanistan. It is one of the driest regions of the world. Economically, it's a very poor region on both sides of the border. Sistan forms a very shallow basin at an average altitude of 482 meters above sea level. The Hamun wetlands in Sistan constitute an integral system that can be divided into subunits connected to each other uh, at high water levels and disconnected at low water levels. The political boundary between Iran and modern Afghanistan splits the Hamun system and further complicate management uh, in this area. Livelihoods and cultural diversity in this region are strongly interlinked with the dependent, uh, strongly inter interlinked with and dependent on the wetland products and services. This fundamental dependence on the wetlands has resulted in the collapse of the local economy during this latest drought period. Sistan area has a very rich history. Bronze Age and early Iron Age settlements have been discovered in Sistan in the lower Helmand Valley by the Helmand Sistan project in Afghan side of Sistan, conducted by the Smithsonian Institution and Afghan Directorate of Archaeology and Historic Preservation in the 1970s. In the Iranian side, Shahre Sukhde or Burnt City, founded around 3200 BC has evidence of the first complex society societies in Eastern Iran and is a world heritage site. Another example is Dahane Qolaman, a significant Achaemenid site in the region. And there is also a well-preserved archeological site of mainly Sasanian date on top of Kuhe Khaje or Mount Khaje in Iran. During the Islamic period, Sistan witnessed the growth of various settlements and cities, including the old city of Zahedan or Zahedan Kohne, which was the capital of the region. Sistan reached its peak in the 12th, 13th, and 14th centuries with more than 500 settlements. Once it was called the region's grain silo due to its fertility. Apart from these important archaeological sites, the traditional villages in Sistan have significant evidence of sustainable way of life and environmental adaptation. The special climate of this extremely arid region has led to the development of a specific type of indigenous architecture as well. But there are several environmental challenges in this region. According to a UNEP report, over 99% of the Sistan, Sistan wetland in Afghanistan is completely dry. As a result of the change in the precipitation pattern, floods are happening more intensively. Population growth has increased the demand for water in domestic sector and irrigation. Irrigation projects such as dam constructions have made water less likely to flow into Hamun lakes. This has disrupted the annual inundation system of Hamuns. Prolonged droughts in the region have led to desertification and the evacuation of many traditional villages. 
These long droughts have continued since the late 1960s, then since the mid 1980s, and then between 1999 and 2005, and then intensified from 2010. The summers in the region are characterized by the infamous 120 day sand wind originating from the lake beds that covers the surrounding villages and areas. The Sistan Basin have been recognized as one of the most active dust sources and windiest desert environments in the world. To study the impact of climate change on Sistan's cultural heritage, the Iemina methodology of remote sensing was applied in a study area around Zabul and Zaranj. About 500 heritage sites were recorded and examined in this study area. In addition to Google Earth, we were also looking at KH9 hexagon imagery of 1977 to better understand environmental changes from the past four decades. The overall condition of these sites, as well as disturbances and threats affecting them, are recorded in the Iamina database using Arches 5 platform capabilities for data analyzing. analyzing. In this study area, different types of built heritage have been recorded and their threats and disturbances have been analyzed. Data analysis shows that over 70% of sites are in very bad condition or already destroyed in the study area. About 95% of sites have been impacted by natural factors driven by anthropogenic climate change. Other disturbance categories impacting sites in this area are agricultural activities, building and development, infrastructure and transport. Among disturbance causes, wind and water action, including sand encroachment, vegetation, precipitation, and flooding, have had the highest rate in terms of impacting sites in this study area. Comparing the results with KH9 imagery of 1977 shows that the process of environmental degradation and abandonment of traditional villages and historical structures was already an ongoing process since the 1970s. But recent imagery from Google Earth confirms that this process has now accelerated. Sistan is a fragile historic landscape affected by climate and environmental changes, as well as social, economic, and political factors. There is a need for a more detailed study to better understand the impact of climate change on cultural heritage and diversity in this region. By examining environmental information and overlaying it with data on the historic built environment, we can try to better understand what types of cultural heritage are primarily at risk and how. To do so, we need to generate baseline data and do a more comprehensive threat assessment in this region. Where possible, collaboration with local partners is a key for success. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rouhani, for that presentation uh, where you walked us through the multi-layered effects and impacts of uh, climate change. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. May I kindly request Mr. Peter Waswa to take the floor and go ahead with his presentation. Over to you. Okay, thank you very much. All protocol observed. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone. I'm Peter Waswa from Institute for Water Research, Lodz University, South Africa. And today uh, I have to first make a disclaimer my study is basically more on literature and some personal observation. So I haven't done a lot of survey in the study area. So today's topic is about climate change as a deteriorating catalyst for Kalamoja subregion culture, a, a region found in Uganda. Sorry. Culture is the total fabric of ideas, belief, customs, traditions, directions, languages, symbols, and other social patterns that distinguish a particular group of people from another. 
it is closely linked to a variety of key factors, though climate change these days has proven to be a critical impact to culture. According to IPCC, climate change refers to a change in climate over time, whether due to natural variability or as, or as a result of human-induced activities. Kalamoja subregion is located in northeastern Uganda. It is a semi-arid region with variable and predictable and often sparse rainfall, blessed with scattered woodlands, thickets, slabs, and indigenous tropical sea for grass that favors pastoralism. Now, where is the problem? This region is notorious a food and water insecure, and it has been surviving from aid of NGOs and the Ugandan government at least for the last two decades. It is vulnerable to both drought and flooding and has supported pastoral groups who have been adapt who has best adapted the electric weather through semi-nomadic transhumancy. Though the communities have adapted themselves, they are still suffering from increasing effects of climate change that have affected their pastoralism nature hence threatening their cultural structures. Despite the community's pasture-based cattle, climate-stressed arid areas in which they are living are under high temperatures and persistent drought. This has negatively set the pastoral communities within this region to countless challenges, including restricted mobility of pastoral herds, reduction in grazing lands, and increased conflicts, between farming and post pastoral communities. The ongoing increase in climate change impacts in this region has forced more people to, to move to city centers, particularly Kampala. And especially, we are seeing young people who don't now see a future in their traditional pastoral livelihoods of their culture. This figure one shows the location of Kalamoja sub region with respect to Uganda. And then it has uh, districts of Kabong, Kotido, Abim, Napak, Moloto, Nabira, Nakapilipit, and Amdat. Some of the findings, for example, from table one, we see a decrease in grassland that favors the character when we take an example from 1986 to 2013 as compared to cropland. This has a significant impact. Mr. Peter, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, could you please uh, do the uh, slide sharing mode so that the slides are visible to all and it's moving because we can see only the first slide. Oh, sorry. Can everyone see the correct yes. slide? Yes, okay. perfect. Yeah, clear now. Next slide, please. Culture is the total fabric of ideas, beliefs, customs, tradition, directions, languages, symbols, and other social patterns. Um, so, okay, let me start on this slide where we can see some of the findings from Dr. Egel Etel 2014. We can see from table one that there has been a decrease in grasslands that favor pastoralism culture from 1986 to 2013 as compared to cropland. And this supports the argument that because of climate change, there has been restricted mobility of pasture herds, reduction in grazing lands that's causing increased conflicts between the farming communities and the pastoral communities in Kalamoja sub region. Next slide, please. Going on, when you look at figure two and three, in figure three, we see the distribution of rainfall and temperatures over Kalamoja sub region. And according to perception from the, the pastoral communities with the in agreement that climate has really changed, and this has been combined with erratic rainfall, drought occurrence, and high temperatures. The impacts of this change has resulted into some of the, like in figure four, we see um, a herdsman trying to feed his cow, but who knows that that water will not even take any more time. So 
these are some of the impacts that the communities are suffering from the, the changing climate. And this, in conclusion, means that they need an urgent, reliable solution to combat the impacts of climate change in this region so that people can restore and keep their wonderful cultures. And this will promote peace and development within the different communities in this region. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Peter, for that wonderful presentation. Thank you for walking all of us through the Karamoja subregion and explaining to us how climate change has affected the community. And you did it wonderfully um, by placing the geospatial uh, knowledge that you have and ground truth it with the community's perception. Wonderful job. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, let us move to the next presentation. Can I invite Ms. Ru Pyongyan to kindly share a screen and do the presentation? Thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Zhou Pingqian. I come from China. And uh, I am a second year doctoral student in landscape architecture in Tianjin University. It's a great honor to have the chance to communicate with scholars at this meeting. The title of my uh, proposal is Early Warming Messages of Cultural Heritage Under Climate Change. Take the summer policy as an example. The rainstorm disasters caused by climate change affects the cultural heritage. As the most representative cultural heritage in China, the protection and management about the summer policy is very important. However, the protection of cultural heritage have no clear and controllable objectives. So I intend to predict the capacity of the summer policy through flood, re, uh, through flood simulation and uh, extreme crime in the future. So as to put for preventive messages to protect the world cultural heritage. At present, many countries have discussed extreme crime disasters, which is a challenge faced by all over the world. The United Nations Action Plan on Water and the Disasters proposals propose that although the threat of global water disaster is increasing under the influence of climate change and human activities, the destructiveness of water disasters can still be reduced through prevention, preparation, and planning. In the front of water disasters caused by climate factors, people can attribute the causes to bad weather events. In fact, another important factor causing is the disasters resistant of the city itself. China's thousands of years about water conservation history is a typical case. Mm, Throughout through the evolution of urban development, there has always been a close relation between Beijing water system and uh, the city. The number of water system decreases in Yuan and Ming and Qing dynasties partly due to the flood control in the northwest suburbs. In the northwest suburbs, the summer policy is the water sources guarantee. And uh, now the, pre uh, the research on about the summer policy is limited to the history change of water system and water management, as well as the research on uh, garden history water heritage and the flood simulation. Mm. So as a research about, uh, as a research at uh, garden history, uh, what can I do to protect the heritage? Mm. I talk about the research plan on heritage protection of the summer policy under extreme crime. <clears throat> Uh, firstly, the history, the history of the water system of the water system construction of the summer policy through historic literatures combined with the 
existing garden space spaces, such as how the Qing dynasties handled the relation between agriculture and uh, landscapes through the water system. It can be seen in Qianlong's imperial points. On the basis of uh, qualitative research, the current summer policy water system is analyzed through software, such as software called Swan. <clears throat> And uh, the water management is divided into water sources and uh, water form and so on. The, for example, the water sources uh, can be analyzed by division angle and uh, water form can be quantified by the bending um, coefficient. It all can be measured by formula. These states will be uh, collecting from actual management and uh, the local government. The disaster early warming according to the simulation dates under different Ramsdor return periods, such as uh, 15 year return period and the 100 year return period. So as to provide a scheme for heritage protection. And uh, this is what I want to highlight. Uh, the above is my uh, preliminary idea at this stage. Mm, in the next stage, I hope to ob obtain rainfall date and uh, ask for the establishment of early warming model. I look forward to your suggestions and hope to have chance to communicate with you. This is my contact information. If you have any idea, you can contact me through WeChat or email. I hope we can establish it, uh, cooperation and uh, contribute, contribute to heritage protection together. And thank you for your listening. I'm finished. Thank you. Thank you, Mizu, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, through your illustrations, you actually showed us that Climate change does increase the frequency and intensity of hydrometeorological hazards, but we also do have the capacities to decrease our vulnerabilities, work on our resilience through data-driven and evidence-based evidence, evidence -based researches. Thank you so much for your wonderful work. Uh, may I now kindly request Dr. Manti to please share your presentation with us. Over to you. Okay. So, I'm very pleased to, to be here and to talk about a small contribution that uh, we would like to discuss with you is uh, about understanding the impact of climate change uh, on tangible cultural heritage materials in Europe mainly. So uh, just so that you know where I'm based, we are based at this little island of Zakynthos in Greece. And this is the Ionian University. So I teach conservation and my colleague teaches environmental sciences. So that's why uh, we are going to approach this from a conservation point of view as well as environmental point of view. So in conservation, it's been since the 90s when Mikalski, he published the first one, he published the factors affecting the preservation of heritage materials, and it is now a historical document, but by no means uh, it's, it's not valid anymore. It's, it's more valid than ever, actually, because he has laid out all the factors affecting the preservation of cultural materials. And uh, this is mainly for the museum. Uh, materials and objects, but it is still valid for all cultural heritage materials because he talks about physical forces, uh, fire, water, pests, contaminants, radiation, incorrect temperature and incorrect relative humidity. Mind you, they all change because of climate change. So it is very valid, all these uh, preventive conservation factors that uh, we take into a museum. Uh, 
on top of that, we also have to deal with things like wildfires, extreme drought. And uh, here I give you two examples that happened recently in Greece in 2020, only last year in 2021, mm. uh, where we had uh, very big wildfires in the whole of Greece, but very, very important sites that were under threat. So there is a lot of need to actually understand the impacts uh, of, uh, of climate change and how this will affect the preservation of heritage materials and sites. Mm -hmm. Pretty much all the things that they have, my pre the previous uh, um, presentations have been talking about. So to sum up in a sense, the preservation in the ground is affected really by the increase of temperature and especially with sites that they are in the permafrost for example they really fast decay if the uh, the materials the organic materials are exposed to uh, uh, the conditions outside the, the the frost flash flooding can cause erosion but as well as the problems that uh, the the wetting and the, uh, suddenly the drying uh, can cause materials on site and the water damage that this will uh, uh, lead to. We also have the drying because of drought of the water log materials and this is especially a problem to the north uh, where we have preservation because of the waterlogged uh, environment and uh, the waterlogged uh, soils. And of course, the wildfires in mainly the south of, of Europe or in areas where there is quite an extensive drought. Preservation in the museum is also going to be impacted, to say the least, because of the increase of the cost to maintain the collections, uh, to study environmental conditions. And this is a, a, a great problem to planning and to housing collections. Uh, planning for evacuation of the collection itself is absolutely critical nowadays because we have several uh, examples where just the flash flooding alone had to uh, result into the evacuation of collections and is coming more and more um, evident this need and the risk of damage overall to the collections because of the environmental change. Uh, sorry, I pressed the wrong button, obviously. Uh, so the positive steps are that to this, several of the organizations who care about uh, our cultural heritage and they organize uh, how to care about the cultural heritage preservation, they have responded to these uh, challenges. And ICROM and uh, ICOM as well as other organizations, but ICROM especially has developed the emergency evacuation guidelines, like for example, the first aid in times of crisis, which was published in 2018. And before that has already uh, developed uh, guidelines on how to deal with uh, disasters and disaster planning for museums, etc. Now, with all the experience that we have in the field, in the sector, is that solidarity and solidarity, again, solidarity is very important for a factor for the emergency responses uh, when museums are affected, because we need a lot of people to take care of, of uh, the first aid in that response. So, if we see it, if we are in a position to put this in a diagram, policy making, of course, is at the top of the pyramid, but this is based on the professional solidarity, the individual preparedness, and the overall preparedness of the sector. However, we would place the training and education at all levels at the very basic, uh, the very the very basis of this pyramid. So training for us is one of the most important factors to deal with, uh, with uh, these uh, problems. 
And uh, one of the good examples amongst other, obviously, that uh, we were able to find is uh, in Australia, actually, that the museum celebrated the 10 year anniversary of the flooding that they had there. And they try with all these different activities to educate the, the local, the public uh, about the risks that they are with uh, climate change and with, uh, with uh, uh, how they can respond to that. Now, recent uh, work uh, has demonstrated that we perceive risk in a very different way. So training how to perceive risk might actually be uh, something that we may want to deal with. And if we look at the, at the timeline of uh, change, and how we adapt to education. Well, actually, how do we adapt with, uh, with um, uh, thank you. Uh, how do we adapt to the, um, to the news of climate change? Uh, this is not very, very fast as far as I understand it anyway. And this is a matter of discussion because IPCC was established in 1988 and the Kyoto Agreement was actually in 97. However, in Google Scholar, when we just look, do a basic uh, search for conservation of cultural heritage and climate change, we only start having uh, papers coming out after pretty much a decade of uh, the first understanding of, uh, of climate change. Uh, and this is also the situation with uh, studies in conservation, a, a journal which is uh, uh, dedicated to the conservation of materials in museum collections, uh, which is only starting kicking off after 2006. So that means that if we are to adapt to a plan or to adapt to uh, learning, to adapt our learning, how fast does this need to be? And uh, obviously we're not alone to answer this question, but we just ran some data from IPCC and uh, we noticed the anomalies only just uh, focusing on Europe, anomaly being the difference between the prediction model uh, which in this case is the worst case scenario that we ran. And uh, the previous century validated with observation results. So what happens if we look at the very, very worst case scenario in the decade uh, 20, well, the 30 years, 2070, hold on, because uh, we're gonna see that the temperature anomaly runs, uh, they are different to the south and the north of Europe. And the same applies, oops, excuse me, the same applies to, to the precipitation. So you can see here in the different months, this is every month for the 30 years average. So you can see here that, if, if I could change the slide, that there is an increase of temperature and uh, obviously as, as we already know. However, uh, we notice also something that perhaps it may be useful uh, to policymakers that uh, the North Europe and the South of Europe, they, they will have eventually uh, different problems to face. And with that, there will come different problems and different challenges that we need to face as a sector in conservation, in the preservation of conservation, depending on the latitude. So uh, the conservation sector will need to be ready for uh, scientific and evidence-based collection management and planning. However, perhaps we need to focus the north and the south 
uh, in a little bit uh, different way, depending on the on the actual needs that we might have. And obviously, we shall need to update the education goals of the national and international curriculum for conservation to be ready for this. So the next step is very important and perhaps it is the only one that matters at this stage and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you Dr. Monty for that wonderful presentation. Indeed it was very very insightful and you added a new dimension to our discussion about conservation and preservation of cultural heritage in the face of the climate crisis. Thank you so much. Um, let me move on to our next speaker, but I will also request those who are attending this meeting, this session, please type in your questions if you have any in the chat boxes, we will take it up just after all the presentations are over. Thank you. And now I would like to invite Ms. Iman Abdel Rahman for her presentation. Hello everybody, this is presentation today, a local climate zone of uh, Ros Rosita uh, Teti, Egypt, or Rashid, uh, but uh, Rosita is uh, a Latin name Rash uh, in Rashid. Outline this presentation in three points. Uh, point one, Rashid uh, heritage. Uh, two, let's see the map of climate impact, culture, and heritage. And last point, LCZ class and result. The first is bio if Rosita or Rashid, uh, but uh, in here located Rashid in Google Earth. Rashid. Rashid is west located in Delta Egypt. This, this view in Egypt and Tunai on Tunai. And over located of uh, the Nile River to Mediterranean Sea, and uh, one of uh, inter of uh, North Egypt in this. This is border in urban Rashid city. Is back to presentation. This map in uh, Rashid. Uh, Rashid uh, is a resistor on uh, WH attendive uh, and uh, publication uh, in, uh, in Rashid uh, based on uh, fishing and fishing craft and uh, for uh, uh, shipbuilding, uh, shipbuilding industry. Uh, this is uh, in uh, Tajik for bird. This is a uh, shown slide in uh, Tajin uh, heat search. I'm sorry. Shown is heritage in Rashid and uh, uh, shown edge uh, Rashid Museum and the uh, fishing area and Tawni Trahin. Uh, LCZ or a local climate uh, zone map uh, in Rashid. This uh, maps uh, creating for uh, LCZ the generator or application uh, impact uh, climate change. Uh, so now this application how to create in uh, urban climate change. Uh, this website, Tonel uh, uh, LCZ uh, area, upload anything uh, Rashid uh, city or uh, any city, calculator uh, name or uh, also uh, name, uh, email, country, city, and upload uh, KMLZ uh, in Google Earth of uh, city that uh, in very important uh, calculator in climate change or urban climate change or back and the calculator website and send for email local climate zone 
calculate in two items, land use and land cover integration for climate uh, data, uh, temperature, uh, humidity, wind, uh, rain, and albedo. Uh, calculator for descri description for city. Uh, L uh, LCZ uh, uh, for uh, 70 layers, uh, 10 layers land use, and 70 layer land cover, uh, plant, soil, uh, trace, uh, uh, water. Uh, this, uh, this slide for shown uh, layer on Rosita plus, and this table for layer appears uh, appear LCZ in uh, Rashid, uh, five layers land use in Rashid and uh, five layers uh, land cover uh, water and the low blend on the grace uh, water and the low blend is, is integration heritage I'm sorry LCZ class this result result on website this Rashid and table impacts in climate change and the urban climate change of Rashid. And thank you. Thank you, Mr. Man, for that wonderful and inspiring presentation, if I might say. Uh, in fact, the idea of having local climate zone maps probably uh, can be uh, explored in other similar regions also. Uh, maybe some of our participants, some of our listeners would like to extrapolate this idea into their own context. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, now we have uh, completed all our presentations and now I would like to invite Dr. Rouhani so that we can open the floor for questions. Um, I have been checking the chat box and I have received, we have received one question to start our discussion. So uh, let me read the question out and then we can go one by one to all the panelists so that they can share their insights and also anyone who would like to add in to that comments, suggestions, they are welcome. So the question goes, what heritage studies can learn from disaster studies? For example, does early warning systems work for heritage preparedness to face disasters? So from our presenters, anyone willing to answer the question? I can start as icebreaker if that works. Uh, well, I think, yeah, there are many lessons that in heritage sector we can we can learn from early warning systems. And definitely, I, I, I believe that such system would be useful for heritage practitioners and professionals as well. But the question is, I mean, the, the, the main lesson before um, implementing that system is understanding how to how to coordinate with other sectors, because I don't believe that, um, for example, early warning system uh, will work um, as a standalone system for, for heritage sector that needs coordination between heritage sector, government agencies, civil defense agencies, and also local communities. Um, in the case study that I presented, for instance, that's a very um, poor region and uh, access to technology um, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a real question. Uh, we need also to ask about whether traditional knowledge in terms of uh, warning system or early understanding or perception of, of risk can, can be a solution in, in those regions or not. So in short, I think, yes, that can, that can help us, but we need to look for, uh, for first coordination with other sectors and also do not forget uh, traditional knowledge, if they can be helpful um, in some regions. Thank you, Dr. Rani, so much. Uh, any, any one of you, uh, the panelists, would want to add into that? And also, uh, all, all, all of our participants, 
if you are willing to add to the discussion please raise your hand and then you can go and definitely add to our discussion yes uh, mr moderator i would like to uh, add a voice to what Bijan has said but the need to include or integrate traditional knowledge and digital knowledge into the early warning system, which are very technological. So it's necessary uh, to think about the fact that uh, indigenous knowledge has a very profound insight into uh, factors and effects which affect or which cause uh, disaster. And therefore, uh, incorporating indigenous knowledge with respect to that would help balance the technological uh, uh, advancements in early warning systems. So I think the point is uh, very valid. It has to be uh, underscored. Thank you so much, Professor Wellington. Thank you so much. We have received another question, uh, if I may read it out. How have you been using your research and mapping to communicate with the public and policymakers to influence policies to protect cultural heritage. Maybe uh, Dr. Manti would like to answer this question. Well, that's why we're here. <laughs> because uh, we try to present the data and to see, to, to communicate with everybody who is interested uh, in this matter and, and to to try to help understanding our point of view and to exchange ideas and to team up and and that's the way to to start from now in in a second level normally if somebody works for a museum the museum normally at least the, uh, in in other places in europe tries to educate the public for matters that they are related to climate change as well and the local community and the exchange information about the flooding for example like the, the the one example that i can think of is flooding and how they have developed maps at cardiff in the uk i'm, I'm not related to that but allow me to to, to talk about this because the, the local community is aware of the floodplains of the river and how this, so therefore from many different places uh, they have started understanding that this is going to be significant for the, their own lives, but also for the culture that exists in the museum as well. And the other, the historical sites that they have all around Cardiff. So, education and knowledge passing on knowledge is something that uh, is important and I, I do think that it's time that we update the university curriculums as well and we introduce these factors a little bit more vibrant in a more vibrant way in the university curriculum for the conservation sector and archaeology as well Dr. Rahani, archaeology as well. <laughs> um, yeah, if, if I may to add something to 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 what uh, Panagiotta already said, I mean, what what she said shows that how how difficult is the task to 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 raise awareness about what is happening and how to communicate it to to people and to local communities. Because again, I want to go back to the region that I was presenting a, a case study from. Um, it's, a, it's a very poor region uh, with difficulties about public education. There are villages without no access even to primary school or even to water. So water should be transferred to, to those villages with tankers and uh, so, I mean, we have all sorts of problems and difficulties for uh, just normal education for, for children, for kids, let alone speaking about cultural heritage. 
uh, that's a very, um, I think, um, a challenge for us in heritage sector, how to include heritage awareness or how to talk to people about heritage awareness and losing their heritage while they have to leave their settlements and villages because of water crisis, because of climate change, because of sand encroachment, because they don't have water. I mean, it's the simplest and the, the most basic human right. They don't have water. And they are leaving villages and settlements. They are going to other regions, other areas, bigger cities. And obviously, because of that displacement of, of people and leaving traditional villages, we are losing cultural heritage in that region. We are losing indigenous architecture. We are losing knowledge. We are using, losing intangible heritage. So I think it's a big problem or a big question for us. And we have to think uh, globally how to, how to tackle the, uh, the challenge. Thank you so much, Dr. Rwani. And, and uh, following this, there's another question. What is the response of the public in practice? Because it seems that um, in the Mediterranean region, people are in denial of the rising sea level, for example. So yes, that is a pertinent issue that many a times the, the science behind climate change or climate crisis is not communicated well, and that's not well received by the communities. So as researchers, as academicians, as practitioners, what are our perceptions about this? Ms. Zhu, if you are willing to answer this question about how responses of the public or the community in large are to okay. imminent climate crisis threats. Mm. Mm. Sorry, my, my English is very poor. You, you should take a moment to analyze what's the meaning about this question Mm, can you repeat uh, the meaning about this question? Thank okay, you. so, okay, fine, uh, not a problem. Let me rephrase the question again so that uh, it's easily understandable to all. Mm -hmm. So um, the question is that we, in, in, in this particular uh, spectrum of academicians, researchers, we do understand the science behind climate change and its pertinent effects and impacts. But many a time what happens is that this science is not communicated to the communities. So they are not aware of the impacts and the effects of climate change, right? But we are doing a lot of effort in this regard. So what is your perception about that? Why, uh, why is there an existing gap between the research that is being done and, and the actions on the ground? Okay. Mm. Mm, maybe I can take an example in, in China. Um, I personally think that uh, the Chinese academic of culture heritage uh, is responsible for uh, statistics and uh, analysis of the annual uh, multi-terrain report, reports submitted by uh, different heritage sites every year and uh, preparing the annual uh, general uh, report of China's world cultural heritage. Mm, the general report mainly involves uh, implementation of the world uh, heritage application commitments, uh, uh, institution and uh, uh, heritage influence uh, factors and uh, protection uh, projects and uh, related research, uh, um, public opinion, uh, monetary and other contents. It aims to analyze and uh, study the overall situation and development trend of China's world uh, cultural heritage uh, protection and management from uh, the macro level and put forward the prospects and uh, uh, strategies for the next stage of the world. Mm. The accumulation of monitoring uh, data over the years uh, through the monitoring annual report has provided reliable data supported for the protection and management of world cultural heritage in China. Mm. 
So I think uh, there should be a early warming platform around the world to report the uh, protect of uh, protection of heritage area and uh, exchange protection methods and uh, uh, to uh, draw a map for heritage protection from all over the world. Mm. This is my personal opinion about this question. Maybe it's a uh, it's not very co correct. Correct. Uh, no, it's, it's perfectly fine. We need to have difference in opinions. We need to have different okay. sets of ideology. So this is actually good. We are having a very good discussion. Uh, Dr. Mandi, you were, you, you were, uh, yes, please add in. Yes, I would like to add that uh, people can have different perception of risk. And this is also a cultural thing as far as I understand it. And um, so perhaps, okay, we, we realize that this is a global problem, but perhaps the local communities will need to adapt to, to the culture and the perception of the individual places. Because it's not just the problem that is different, it's also the perception about the problem that we might have different so we need to juggle between those two factors and first understand the problem and then understand how we can actually deal with this uh, mm -hmm. on, on all aspects how to pass on and all these yes um aparna you were uh, you had something to add to the discussion uh, because uh, the question that you ask about uh, you know making it uh, the people in if I heard it correctly, Middle East uh, or in certain regions are not very well aware of the climate risks or are not understanding the urgency of the matter. And I think too, as, as uh, Dr. Monty has uh, pointed out, uh, thank you first of all for all the excellent presentations also. Uh, you, as you pointed out that uh, it's, it's a matter of perceptions, risk perceptions. And also, um, I think that's the whole point of this uh, conference also in a way that culture is a powerful mediator. And if you will ask uh, perhaps, uh, you know, a person from India about, uh, you know, fire safety, and if you will perhaps ask somebody who's living in a Nordic country uh, on fire safety, the perceptions will be very different. The behaviors around that would be very different. And I think these have to be taken into consideration to uh, by uh, scientists as well as cultural heritage uh, sector and the, and the information about cultural uh, climate change has to be tailored to the context. And that's why I think culture would be such a powerful ally in understanding that how it is mediating or shaping perceptions uh, around cultural uh, um, on climate change. And it would be great if I can hear from our panelists and presenters today. Uh, what do they think about it? Because I think there is a dearth of tools. Uh, we have developed one vulnerability and capacity assessment game, which tells you a little bit about, uh, helps in finding community-based, uh, communities' risk perceptions. And when I say community, I mean a wide variety range of uh, groups of people uh, who are embedded in a certain context. So it will be great to know from the panelists. Ms. Iman, if you would like to share, uh, share your insights with us on this. She's mute, muted. Sorry, yes. is it me? Um, no, I was asking Ms. Iman, but it, yes, if you're willing to answer, you can always go ahead. Uh, well, I can always talk, you know. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, th that's that's great. I'm I really look forward to finding more about the tool that you say that you're using about understanding perception. I do also agree with you saying that the uh, the cultural sector and conservation and also all the other sciences, not just the environmentalists. They, they, we all need to join forces to understand the situation and to be able to act upon it. Because I think that uh, 
because of the way that we, how long it takes to adapt the systems, uh, we perhaps need to to act a little bit faster, perhaps. That's my personal opinion. And in order to do that, perhaps we need to focus on on the differences rather than what is the same thing, because the needs for Mrs. Uh, Dr. Rouhani's side are very, very different in how, uh, how the public perceives and adapts change is going to be very different to Europe. And this is what I'm saying, that even within Europe, the North and the South will have very different problems and challenges to face. And perhaps we need to, to focus on these differences because we can adapt faster. That's the only thing that I can think of. Yes. If I may add just one word to, to what uh, Paniota said, uh, replying to Aparna I mean, about, about Aparna's question. I think Aparna, the, the, the culture is already doing its job. Uh, a conference like this, has brought together people from different backgrounds, different regions, facing different aspects of climate change on different types of heritage. Someone is talking about a landscape, another person is focusing on a, uh, on a museum in Europe, the other person is talking about intangible, losing intangible cultural heritage because of displacement of people. So I think culture is already doing its job in raising uh, awareness globally, how different types of problems and, and challenges that we have and which needs our joint effort to think about them, not just finding the solution, but think about them and talking to each other. So I think culture uh, has been successful um, in that aspect, at least in that aspect. Yeah. We, if we I may are, just uh, at this point, Yes, Professor Wellington, yes. Yeah, yes, indeed. Culture has played quite a major role in uh, the development of attitudes and perceptions of the uh, issues related to climate change as to how it affects the environment, as to how it affects uh, cultural heritage, as to how it affects the economy of local people. Yes, but to my mind, what has been the missing factor is having a scientific basis of these traditional perceptions. So uh, it is necessary that a uh, way forward is to how to incorporate scientific way of thinking into these traditional attitudes. And of course, that should come through the children, schooling, education, you know, because they will become the agents for the future. So uh, in as much as I, uh, underscore the point that culture has played a major role, I believe that there's a need to inculcate some scientific thinking, scientific attitudes in the cultural perceptions which we have. Thank you, Professor Wellington, for underlining the importance of inculcating the spirit of inquiry, scientific inquiry, to be very precise. Uh, we, are, we are almost about time, so I will have two questions. Uh, the first one is, for Dr. Rouhani, how do you think research institution can help affected countries with little resources and lots of political instabilities? Well, I think, uh, yeah, the, the, the relationship between research institutions and local communities has been always a question, not always uh, collaborating with each other, not always being on the same level or uh, listening to each other research institutions sometimes have this habit to do their own research without involving local communities. I think because it's a global problem, climate change, and because it is impacting each region in its own way, research institutions cannot lead um, projects or cannot lead research alone without collaborating uh, at the same level, on an equal level, with communities who have been impacted. So, I mean, uh, this is this is a basic principle for for a research about impacted communities and countries who do not have access to resources um, for research and for mitigation. So that should be considered well into designing your research framework. 
Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, one last question to Dr. Manti. What could be the effects of climate change on the patina layer that covers and protects the cultural heritage for a long time? Specifically on the patina layer. Right, okay. Well, <laughs> where do we start from? Where do we start from? It does depend on the type of patina that it is and the type of uh, material that we have. Do you talk about patina on a bronze sculpture or do you talk about the time patina in a sense that we might have on on stone marble, on marble? Uh, I'm not quite sure I understand the question, but I will try to answer it as well as I can. All changes that they happen, I mean, uh, corrosion and deterioration is a natural phenomena. We can't change that. However, uh, we can change how fast things might happen. I mean, it will happen eventually. It's just that we don't want it to happen very, very fast. We want it to happen to, to, to be able to maintain our material culture for at least the next generation. We want to have to the, the preservation needs to happen for the next generations to enjoy our culture and the arts and, and everything. So, if the patina specifically is a matter of uh, of concern, well, then we should uh, focus on researching how fast this is going to to be affected and if this is going to be detrimental for the preservation of the object that they're talking about. I'm sorry, I can't be any more specific, but I don't know the context of this question. I hope I answered. Uh, as much yes, as I yes, yes, yes. So, yeah. I guess uh, that brings us to the end of this session. I, I, I am looking at the chat box and there are many questions and statements that have come up, but really we are running short of time and we cannot take up all the questions and continue with the discussions. So I will hand it over to Dr. Rouhani for the final concluding remarks, wrapping up of the session. Over to you, Dr. Rouhani. Thank you very much, Rukhal. Uh, yeah, I have some notes and remarks from uh, the presentations that we have had today and I will be very fast. Uh, we learned from Professor Wellington that manifestations of threats to her heritage resources in Ghana include, as observed in the co continuous rising of seawater levels along the beaches, threatening the continuous existence of settlements with their heritage sites, including heritage properties that may have outstanding universal values. We also learned that communities located in geographical zones where effects of climate change are manifesting endemically should be assisted to build capacities to live proactively with the effects of climate change with the goal to change negative habits and practices that exacerbate effects of climate change and install and enforce local planning regulation uh, for their settlements. In Sistan region, I think a more detailed study with comprehensive threat assessment is needed to better understand and map the impacts of climate change in this area. Open source imagery as well as historical aerial photographs can help to monitor how the landscape has changed in recent decades. In mapping the impact of climate and environmental changes in Sistan, but also in other regions, we should also look at other factors such as the impacts of development, as well as social, economic, and political factors. Mapping should not be limited to archeological sites and built heritage, but it needs to consider the impact on intangible heritage as well. From Peter Waswell, we learned that it is important to provide urgent, reliable solutions to combat the impacts of climate change in Karamoja sub-region so that people can restore and keep their traditional cultures. This will also promote peace and development within the different communities in that sub-region. Zhu Pingxian told us that the Summer Palace is one of the most 
representative world cultural heritage in China and its protection and management is very important for the communities. Predicting the bearing capacity of the summer palace to extreme climate through rain and flood simulation under different rainstorm return periods so as to put forward preventive measures to protect this uh, world heritage is, is, is her work, her research. And Dr. Monty told us about the conservation and museum sector. They have different challenges to face depending on latitude. There is a need to update the educational goals at all levels to train conservators and museum staff with at least some first aid assisting to the long-term preservation of cultural heritage. And finally, Dr. Iman Abdul Rahman talked about local climate zone maps with open source data linked to remote sensing data and GIS applications that can help to represent a realistic representative of urban climate change. Uh, these local climate zones should be considered as a dynamic application. With this, we come to the end of this session. I shall thank all the presenters and panelists and Rapal uh, for moderating uh, this session. I should also thank Ikram and Aparna for providing this opportunity for all of us. And finally, the British Council Cultural Protection Fund for sponsoring this conference. Thank you very much and hope to talk to all of you soon again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, thank you. Thank you.